I want to welcome everybody to a very special service today. I had to laugh at one point because I looked out and there wasn't anybody there, and then in comes all the gentlemen without the wives, because a lot of the wives <laughs> are up here. So today, the service is being put on by um, your Presbyterian women here in the church, so they are going to be doing the whole service pretty much. So I look forward to it, and I hope you'll have a, a grand time in worship with them. Because of that, there is one part in the service that's a little different today, and that is the people's prayer. Um, and I just found out that one of the people that we've been praying for, Dom, has passed. So if you would hold his family in prayer this this week, um, because he just passed yesterday, right, Scott? Yeah. So Scott was um, neighbors and good friends, so friends and family of Dom, we hope, in prayer. Um, so a special thank you to the Park Presbyterian women for the service today, and you'll notice that it's focused on Mary and the, the mother of Jesus. Please make sure, uh, I think everybody here, you guys are real good with the bulletin, the purple um, hymns. The flowers today up front are given in memory of Matthew Lotz by the Edward Lotz family. So. And birthdays this week. Luke Taylor's birthday is tomorrow. And Bob Finewoods and Julie Blodgett's are the fourth, which would be this next Saturday. So if you see any of them, wish them a happy birthday. This week, stewardship letters I hope will be going out before the end of the week. Um, next Sunday, we have the little red wagon collection, communion by intinction, worship, and worship and music meeting following that worship service. So there's a lot um, next Sunday. The Little Red Wagon Collection, the food, communion by intinction and worship, and then a worship and music meeting. Are there any further announcements today? Okay. If not, would you pray with me? God of history, you know our story better than we know ourselves. You are the Alpha and the Omega with us from the beginning and with us until the end. Your steadfast love is our ever-present help and hope. We praise you for your faithfulness. And despite our wanderings and failures, you have not abandoned us. We are your people. You are our God. As we come together today, inspire our hearts and minds through the reading and the proclamation of your word, through the liturgy and through our singing and music, energize us and send us out as your faithful servants, ready to do what we are inspired to do, to con or what we are inspired to do to continue Jesus' mission here and now in the week ahead. And let us all say, Amen. <laughs>
Please join me in the call to worship. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise is so to be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name together. I sought the Lord and was answered. God delivered me from all my fears. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear God and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in God. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Let us pray. Holy God, your prophets have long spoken of the one who would come to save us. Now the promise is fulfilled. Now your kingdom has come near. Send us as messengers of your way to go and tell all the world of the wonders we have seen and the good news we have heard. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join me to the call call to confession. Search us, O God, and know our hearts. Test us and know our thoughts. See if there is any hurtful way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. And now is the litany of confession. Creator God, mighty one. Jesus Christ and Redeemer. Holy Spirit, Counselor and Sustainer. Our God and Savior, you have looked upon us with favor and we have been blessed. Your mercy has found us. Your strength has sustained us. Your love has redeemed us. Yet 
we stray from your way. Have mercy on us. We confess we don't always recognize nor show your mercy. We confess we believe the strength that sustains us in our own. We confess we take your love for granted. Have mercy on us. We are misled by our prejudices, fear, and pride. We cling to power and wealth for our own benefit. We confess that our love for others wavers and we become indifferent toward the vulnerable, ignoring the hungry, and rejecting the poor. Have mercy on us. You came to the aid of your children and through Jesus became one of us and we became indifferent toward the vulnerable, ignoring the hungry, and rejecting the poor. Okay, now through Jesus. That we may recognize your mercies and in turn practice mercy. Help us. To love as you have loved us and to find strength and courage, humility and service. Restore us. That we may walk in your favor and magnify you in words and deeds. Poor Christo. Amen. Sisters, sibling, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be God. to God. Amen. God has received us. God has pardoned us, loved us. Let us forgive each other in love and share the peace of Christ. Peace be with you. And also with you. Listen to our prayer of illumination. Lord God, in this dry and dusty place, pour out the power of your spirit so that your word may blossom in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our way in the wilderness. Amen. Our first reading, and the only one this morning, is Luke 1, 45 through 56. This is the time when Mary learned that she had conceived and she went to see Elizabeth, who had also uh, conceived, and she was the older woman who no one expected her to be pregnant. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. This is Mary's song of praise. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowly state of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Indeed, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of the child Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months 
and then returned to her home. This is the word of the Lord. his name, evermore praise is proclaimed. All creatures great and small now rejoice, sing blessings unto his name. All that have life and breath with one voice, now now with praise is proclaimed. Shout with the sound of a mighty voice to glorify thy holy name. Well, good morning, Stu. How are you today? Well, today we are celebrating a very special day at our church. Today we are celebrating the gifts of the women in their lives. And I bet you have a lot of women in your life that have helped you along the way, like teachers and doctors and nurses and mothers and aunts and cousins. But there are a lot of people that have helped you. And today our story is called the night of his birth, and it was written by Katherine Patterson and is illustrated by Lisa Lisato. And the pictures in this book are very are beautiful. And the story today is about Mary. 
She is the mother of Jesus. And the story takes place the night that Jesus was born. The night of his birth. Sing out, my soul, the wonder. They are gone now, those shepherds, smelling of their sheep and rubbing their faces with chapped and grimy hands, eyes still dazed with angel light. Please, can we touch him? Their hands reached toward the child, my arms held close. How could I say no? God is the best host of this strange celebration in which I am also a guest. Like these rough men, I too was startled by the angel. Hail, most favored one, he said. And through his messenger, God summoned me as though to play a divine joke on a prideful world. Pity Isaiah. When that noble prophet sang of David's coming son, could he have dreamed of me? Now even my mother could do that. When I returned so full of joy from Elizabeth's house, she met me with angry tears. She could not believe the good news my swelling body bore. My own mother, who once held me, just as I held, hold this child of mine. My father did not speak, but I could see the questions in his eyes. Does she lie? Has she gone mad? And which is better? There be no comfort in either answer. They are sick with shame, for they are simple, pious people who care what the neighbors say. Even Joseph doubted, but how could I blame him? An angel come to Nazareth? God's Holy Spirit come to me, a nothing child, a poor man's girl. King David's mighty shout shrunk to a whisper in their peasant blood, but God is good. Joseph had his own stern visitor, and though my man sang no magnificent, he, he did obey. God give him joy for that. And there he sits, meaning to keep watch, his head a stone upon his chest, not knowing he trust. My heart swelled to feel his pain, his puzzlement. And then tonight, I saw the gentle way he washed his son God into his care. The boy stirs in his sleep. I have fed him, and he is satisfied. Can you believe it? God's anointed one upon my breast with milk, just there at the corner of his tiny mouth. And there's the baby Jesus. His hair is black and thick and stands up like weeds upon his head. I try to smooth it with my lips, but it springs back, refusing my correction. I laugh aloud. My Joseph moans, I have disturbed his rest, but how can I be silent? Every part of my shouts and sings, I have brought a child into the world. From my own flesh has come this perfect thing. And there is Joseph sleeping through all this. A little hand pokes through the, hand, through the bands. I'm practiced as I am. I have not wrapped him well. He moves within the claws to nestle into the curve of my body. We are almost one again, but now I can see him. I can touch him. I can nurse him and care for him. He is God's. I know that. I heard the word of angels and my cousin's cry of praise. I saw it in the rough fingers of the shepherds smoothing this door downy, check, in wordless worship. See those big eyes? Oh, they're really big, aren't they? He is God's. And God's ways are past all my understanding. I cannot see the man he will become, or even the ruddy-cheeked boy. I do not know what God will ask of him, or me. I am the handmaid of the Lord, my son, his servant. Dare I say, my son, God's son. 
But now this morning, the light breaks. The world wakes to a day that has never been. And I hold my baby in my arms. And that alone is miracle beyond belief. And there is a nice picture of Mary and baby Jesus. It's the night he was born. Sing out, my soul, the wonder. So that's the story of the night when Jesus was born. So let us pray. Thank you, God, for sharing the gift of Jesus with us. Thank you for Mary's love and devotion for her son, Jesus. Help us to celebrate the gift of all women and give thanks to God. You love us so much. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Our sermon today is Mary, was she submissive or strong? We've grown up hearing about Mary and the Immaculate Conception. So I'm curious, what's your view of Mary? When she encounters the angel Gabriel, was Mary a young submissive girl or something more? The sermon today will address this question. When Mary is first greeted by the angel Gabriel, he says, do not be afraid for you have found favor with the Lord and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call him Jesus. What might your reaction have been to an angel foretelling your future? I think my 14 year old self would be quaking in my boots to tell you the truth. Well, Mary, to her credit, simply asked, how can that be? No pushback, just a simple question. I think it's pretty gutsy, don't you? So when the angel answers her question saying, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, therefore the child to, to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Mary's response was, let it be according to your word. Now many theologians and historians have considered her response to be submissive, but I'd like to put forth another viewpoint. I believe that Mary's reaction comes from a very strong sense of faith. To illustrate my point, there's a few basic facts about Mary that I'd like you to consider. First, Mary was born late in life to Joachim and his wife. Both were elderly and had prayed dilig diligently for a child. When the Lord granted their prayers, they were needless to say, delighted. To thank the Lord for answering their prayers, they promised that Mary would be raised in the word of the Lord. So at the very young age of three, her parents took Mary to the temple of Jerusalem where she would live until she was 14. During this time, she was taught everything about her faith. While she lived there, her elderly parents died making Mary an orphan. Mary continued at the school until we, she was 14 when she could no longer stay there. At that age, she was considered old for a Jewish girl to be eligible for marriage. Nevertheless, the school arranged for Joseph, an elderly wid widower, to marry her. Now, imagine growing up and living at Park Church. What might your experience have been? What might that experience have taught you? How many times would you have heard the story of creation or any of the other wondrous acts of God? Consider, for all but three years of Mary's life, she was surrounded by and schooled in her faith. For 11 years, while she grew up in the temple, 
Mary literally lived in and breathed her ancestors' history and their faith. So, given Mary's upbringing, I'm fairly confident that Mary would have had been well-versed in the stories of her ancestors, brave women who, when faced with difficulties, called on their God for strength. And in that moment with the angel, Mary could have likely recalled any number of women who had perhaps interacted directly with God or Gabriel. There's Miriam, who was a sister prophet to Moses and Aaron. Miriam was the Bible's first female prophet and was known for her joyful singing and celebrations of the Lord. But her older brother took the credit for the big prophecy of the Ten Commandments. Some big brothers can be like that. But Miriam only, was only the first of many female role models that Mary would have learned about. There's an incredibly long list of female prophets and heroes, which, thanks to recent historians and theologians' research, have come to light for all of us to admire and emulate. Let's consider just a few. First, there was Devorah, we call her Deborah, and her counterpart, Yael. During the Canaanite captivity, Deborah was the acting judge for all the Jewish people. She ruled over small squabbles and big religious matters. She also acted as the Jewish people's military advisor. There's no explanation on how Deborah was appointed in this role, but she must have been widely respected to have sway over the entire Jewish community. It was Deborah who decreed it was time to take up arms and fight their captors, and with Barak, she led the army to victory. The only Canaanite survivor of the battle was the king's general, Sisera. At the battle, Sisera saw that it was a losing fight, so he fled the scene and sought refuge in the tent of Yael. Yael was most likely, likely a part of an independent neighboring tribe. When Sisera asked for water and a safe hiding place, Yael gave him milk and hit him. Then she seized the moment, took a tent peg, and smashed his head in. Gruesome, I know, but it was ancient times. So together, Deborah and Yael freed the Jewish tribes from their Canaanite captors. Pretty impressive role models, don't you agree? Next on the long list of females to influence the Jewish history and faith was Huldah. Huldah was the prophet during, during Josiah's reign as the Israelite king. Huldah foretold Josiah of the Israelites' coming downfall, downfall for having failed to follow the Lord's laws. She did this by authenticating a scroll as the written word of the Lord and predicting the Israel's fate. Josiah is known for having tried to clean up Israel by banning the idols and sacrifices to those idols. For, Hida, for Huldah, there's actually a stone structure in Israel called Huldah's Gates to commemorate her. Our next prophet to wield her influence was Esther. Esther was orphaned and then adopted by an uncle, Mordecai. King Assyrius, had decreed all beautiful virgins should be brought to him so he could select a new queen. He'd banished his first queen when she failed to come at his bidding. Despite Esther being a Jew, her uncle included her in this roundup, in this cattle call, most likely so he could gain favor with the king. Of course, Esther was selected. As the story goes, Mordecai learned that the king's prime minister Haman had, was plotting to kill the Jews. Mordecai then insisted that Esther should go to the king and plead for the life of the Jews. For Esther to go to the king unsummoned meant she would be risking her life, especially with a king who had already banned his first wife for not following his orders. Esther did risk her life and was successful in persuading the king to protect the Jews. Amazingly, in the Bible, it was Mordecai who was given all the credit for saving the Jews. 
This list of female heroes and prophets could include many more. There's Rahab, the harlot, who saved herself and her family when the walls of Jericho came down by striking up a bargain with the spies that visited her brothel. And Alethea, who served as king when her husband and son were murdered. And we can't forget Jephthah's daughter, who when she was told by her father that she was to be sacrificed, she asked for two months to live freely in the mountains. And then she returned to him to be sacrificed. Clearly, Mary had many role models to draw strength from when the angel came to her. And this is despite knowing that in the Jewish culture, an unwed expectant mother could be put to death for her, for her impropriety. It's my opinion, and it's shared by many current theologians, that Mary stepped into her faith. And according to the Band of Angels author Kate Cooper, Mary acted, quote, not with confusion or reluctance, but with swift acceptance. But I will offer additional evidence to consider Mary's strength of will. We all know of Mary's actions with Jesus at the wedding at Canaan when she implored her son to turn water into wine. She was frequently present when Jesus preached, and of course she was present at his crucifixion. But here's something you may not know. In Acts 1, verse 14, after Jesus was crucified, the disciples gathered in the upper room. Mary was there, and she, she, she led them in, in prayer. Interestingly, Mary has been reported that the disciples acknowledged her right to lead them and considered Mary their liturgical leader. She preached. She healed, she exercised demons, and most importantly, she baptized converts. In the Gospel of Bartholomew, Mary was noted as taking bread and wine at the temple altar. Also, in the Proto-Evangelism, a, a writing about the early Christians, Mary was reported to have been inside the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctum of the temple which is an area reserved for only the highest of the high priests, all male. Following the crucifixion and ascension, Mary was reported in the six books, another Christian book of the period, as having preached the gospel to the governor of Jerusalem. Additionally, she gave books to female converts, sending them out to spread the word. She obviously had a large part in spreading the word, which for me demonstrates a great deal of leadership. From this information, I'm inclined to think that Mary was a very self-assured because of her faith. Mary's leadership must have influenced other women as well. As the word spread, apostles like Paul relied on sponsors who were primarily independent women who helped by providing their homes for worship thus establishing the first Christian churches, called house churches. The first churches were named for these women, Chloe, Nympha, Aphia, Priscilla, Lydia, and Mary, mother of Mark. In addition to the house churches, there were also four well-known female apostles, Mary Amni, Irene, Nino, and Thecla. After hearing Paul preach the gospel, Thecla canceled her, en her engagement and baptized herself. Paul then sent her out to preach and baptize her converts. Nino baptized 40 women in a monastery on her way to Iberia and was responsible for the conversion of the people of the first century Georgia. Irene was baptized in the first century by Timothy and converted 10,000 pagans. Once established in the city of Nisibisus, she baptized another 130,000 people and was considered the bishop of the new Jesus communities. All these women have followed in Mary's footsteps, and Mary continues to inspire women around the globe. For, year, for years, Park Church's Presbyterian Women's Group have conducted and or supported mission activities, 
such as Family Promise, the local food closet, and Laurel House, and have recently adopted Common Threads, Survivor Advocacy, and Call to Care as their newest mission activities. Other Presbyterian women's groups have undertaken similar mission activities. For example, the Johnson Auxiliary in Memphis, Tennessee, is made up of members of the Presbyterian women of the Idlewild Presbyterian Church. For 50 years, these Presbyterian women and other volunteers from the community have supported the Regional Medical Center in Memphis. They've done this in ways large and small, from offering coffee and pastries to people waiting on loved ones, to organizing educational programs such as breast self-exams, teen pregnancy, CPR, and programs on sickle cell anemia. Furthermore, over the years, the auxiliary ran the hospital's gift shop and generated more than $460,000 in profits to benefit their burn unit, a meditation room, and funding for scholarships. In conclusion, when women have been called to act, it's frequently behind the scenes, in quiet and unassuming ways. Their reticence drawing attention and recognition for their good work probably leaves many Americans thinking women don't have an impact on society, that we're still the submissive girl that many have called Mary. But as a faith-based group, the Presbyterian women of Park Church, we know that is not the case. As we celebrate 35 years of the Presbyterian Women Association within the Presbytery, I believe we can safely say that Mary's example of strength and courage continues to guide women in today's world missions. I invite you to join us to step out in your faith as Mary did all those many centuries ago. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the gift of Mary's leadership. May her strength of faith stir our hearts with compassion and her courage inspire our actions. Amen. Our next hymn is 439.
This is the litany of gratitude and celebration. Today we celebrate the blessing of our God calling women at all stages in life from diverse ages, languages, cultures, races, backgrounds, and in all circumstances. We celebrate God's gifts bestowed upon us, a variety of gifts and services for the common good, activated by one and the same spirit. We are grateful. For women of all ages who serve God and neighbor in committees and on boards, as members, elders, and deacons, as mid-council leaders and beyond, for, women, for young women, tweens, and teens who serve in manifold ways, and for the advisors who mentor, listen, and hold space for their growth in wisdom and grace, for nominating committees that recognize potential and promise, hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit in all voices regardless of age. We celebrate and give thanks to God. For women who work toward a more just world, one free of biases, discrimination, food insecurity, and poverty. For women entrepreneurs, homemakers, students, and volunteers who partner and lead, who sit on decision-making boards, who head micro enterprises, small businesses, nonprofits, corporations, churches, and ecclesiastical bodies. We celebrate and give thanks to God. For congregations, faith-based organizations, and women's rights organizations, advocating for and empowering women and girls, for those who work in refugee camps and border ministries, for those who work in help, help lines and call centers, who provide health care and counseling, pastoral care and accompaniment to women and families, for those who offer women a welcome, confirmation, safety, and care. We give thanks to God for all service and love and action. For foremothers, trailblazers, role models, mentors, activists, educators, reformers, innovators, peacemakers, motivators, advocates, coaches, and preachers. We celebrate and give thanks to God. We celebrate you and we celebrate the blessing of God's call. We give thanks for the gifts this rich diversity brings to building God's kingdom. We pray in gratitude and joy, magnifying God for God's favor. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As a farmer plants the seeds and waits for the rains to come, let us entrust our gifts that the Lord um, to the Lord as we await the coming of God's rain. Stand as you are able and we'll sing We Are in Offering.
Would you join me in the prayer of thanksgiving? Thanks be to you, O God, maker of heaven and earth, giver of justice, lover of righteousness, hope of the afflicted and friend of the poor. Your faithfulness never fails. Take and use these gifts we offer to further your purpose in the world and to fulfill the promise of the world to come. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Our last hymn is 100. My soul cries out with a joyful shout.
Go forth and be blessed, favored ones. God is indeed with us as we live by faith, stand in hope, and share love. <laughs> Let us witness to God's abundant grace and mercy from generation to generation. Amen. Amen.